Off top, ants don't have lungs. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. All right, welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. I'm very excited to be joined by the great, the pioneer of the white don't crack movement. (laughs) <laughs> the ageless Jeff Passon. Look at you. It's you, it's Charlie, it is Phil Yates, the only ageless white man in America, and I love that I know all of you. <laughs> well, listen, we're we're doing we're doing our part, and the the best part of of the genetics um, for me is that uh, our mutual friend Mike Ryan has accused me in the past yeah. of coloring my Dying hair it, right? as yeah. well. Yes, it is not. Now, I, I will admit, I have been on performance enhancing drugs to keep the full head of hair oh. for a good 20 or so years now. Because as you guys can see, like these ears with a bald head, like it, it you know, it doesn't work very well. So th- there's a little bit of narcissism involved there. But uh, I'd like to thank my parents for um, the, the 46 chromosomes that they gave me. <laughs> there was, um, I think it was Bill Burr was making a joke about uh, how um, the reason why black people age well is because we use lotion. Mm. And I wasn't sure, maybe that was just the difference. Maybe you just got a hands on lotion, but you're saying it's genetics. I don't use lotion. The only, you should, I, uh, the only <laughs> lotion I use at all is sunscreen. Yep. Because if it's, I don't this slather is the, this myself is the link. in this SPF is the link. 70, like, I I go oh from zero to lobster within 15 <laughs> minutes. And oh, nobody man. needs to see peelings. No, that's that's nasty. So, uh, yes, I'd like to thank sunscreen as well. Uh, but aside <laughs> from that, yeah. <laughs> we, we did bring you on to talk about um, the Shohei scandal and get ready for the baseball season. Generally, this has been fun. We'll get back to this before you we let you go, because before the show started, we talked a little bit about you being a baseball dad. And I was surprised because I think of you as one of the like most kind and controlled human beings I know. And from what I heard from your baseball stories, <laughs> it changes when you're watching your son pitch. But we'll get to that. Charlie, where do you want to start? All right. We'll start with Shohei Otani with the story that's sort of honestly it's crossed over a lot because it's ticked a lot of boxes people are interested in. Sports gambling, the biggest star in American baseball who has an amazing international appeal at Shohei Otani is a two-way player who's not going to pitch this season because of UCL surgery but was planning to hit for the Dodgers and 4.5 million dollars went from his bank account to an illegal bookmaker in California. It has since come out that it's from an, inter- an interpreter who was betting. Sorry to cut you off, Charlie. I like that you tried to make it seem like us in America are like some highbrow society. It's scandal, and it feels dirty yes. and confusing, and it's a mystery, and that's what we like. We that's don't right. care about all that other stuff. Okay, so Jeff, what to you? You're going to be much more knowledgeable about this than we are. To you in the audience, what is the most important details about everything that's going on with Shohei to start? I think they're two places that we need to look at here. And and it starts with, uh, listen, when someone tells me a story, I'm going to believe it, but I'm also going to check it. I'm also going to be skeptical about it. It's the uh, listen or trust, but verify. Right. And so at this point, I'm trusting that the story that Shohei Otani's camp is telling is truthful. The problem is it's just missing so much right now. And what it's missing at this point and what I'd like to fill in is what happened between the time that Ipe Mitsuhara, the interpreter for Shohei Otani for the entirety of his time here in Major League Baseball, uh, what happened between the time that he talked with Tisha Thompson, the incredible investigative reporter for ESPN, during a 90-minute conversation in which he admitted to gambling Uh, but also suggested uh, that Shohei Otani had knowingly paid off his gambling debts. And the point of, you know, 24 or so hours later, where Tisha heard back from Otani's team, and the response was, um, none of what he said was true. We completely disavow it. This was a quote-unquote massive theft. What was learned during that period of time? 
um, what happened and when did it happen and where did it happen and how did it happen? These are all pertinent facts if we're going to take this story at face value. So that's number one. Um, number two, I, I think an important element of this is to whom did Otani's camp refer this criminally? Uh, you know, once we get a sense of where this is going criminally and if Ipe Mitsuhara is going to be charged, there's going to be a whole lot more information that's out there publicly. That, that's just what happens when you have criminal cases. And that information, as well as the investigation that comes from that, is probably far more likely to expose the full breadth of what's involved in this whole situation because there's subpoena power involved and because, uh, you know, the, they are going to have access to documents that, that we as reporters generally don't. So those are the two things that I'm looking at right now. But the ultimate question I think here is how much did Shohei Otani know yeah. and when did he know it? And is there any involvement from him in this situation, despite the fact that everyone says there isn't? And most of all, did anyone bet on baseball? Yeah, now, yeah. Everyone that's the big one. Who, so, yeah, everyone who's so, talked with Tisha has said to this point that that is not the case. But I imagine there are all kinds of records out there that even the authorities don't have mm -hmm. at this point, and all sorts of people with whom they haven't spoken. And, and until that is 100% dead solid, perfect confirmed, that's going to be the thing that's lingering over this entire case. So um, I think it was Ben Lindbergh's piece in The Ringer that I read that kind of, because I think before I read that piece and had all the information in one place, like I had what I thought was the most plausible story. And seeing all the facts, it feels like none of the stories are 100%, or obviously not 100%, right. but none of the stories, they all seem believable. And they all seem realistic. Like it all seems, at first I was like, well, there's no way his interpreter could have done this without him knowing. And then you're like, well, when he met him, he was 18 years old. He's 10 years older. He's been with him throughout this entire process. Yes, uh -huh. that's somebody that I could trust to have access to my account. And then it's also like, who's looking out for who in this situation? It all makes sense. Like, yeah, I would, I would, if I had $700 million promised to me, yeah, I got my dog for a cool four just to get you all. Like, that makes <laughs> sense to me. And if I am the interpreter, it's like, okay, my guy's worth 700 million. Yeah, I'm going to take the dog for my man because that's he's the the cash cow so this just seems like the perfect mystery and the i guess the reason why it's a bit of a fun mystery is because nothing too sinister has happened yet or has been uh exposed and that would be betting on baseball which brings us back right. to that final question that is outstanding because i i feel like is this just marijuana from like 10 years ago? You know, like how we got all up in arms when people were with test positive and now it's like, it's no big deal. I yeah. feel like sports gambling is going in the same direction. Of course, there's risk and danger to um, open up gambling to the broader society, but I don't think anyone who follows sports is actually appalled as long as he's not betting on baseball. I understand it's a legal card or excuse me, an illegal bookmaker, but like, I'm not clutching my pearls. Nor should you. And, and that's the thing. I mean, California is one of, what, 10 to a dozen states that doesn't have legalized sports betting at this point. Right. I, I'm not going to say that gambling with an illegal bookie is jaywalking, but it's certainly not the sort of crime one would expect uh, authorities to pursue with great vigor. And, right. it, you know, it needs to be a... a pretty big case for that to to be the case and uh so the the involvement of these secondary and tertiary people in this whole probe which is frankly what Ipe Mitsuhara and Shohei Otani would be at this point I don't think anyone's saying you know the throw the guy in jail and and get rid of the key it's it's not that um but when baseball is involved it's almost like Major League Baseball's rules on this Dom Major League Baseball has had a situation like this before where one of its players was gambling with an illegal bookie. His name was Jarrett Kosart. And mm -hmm. in MLB's rules, it is up to the commissioner's discretion how to handle that. And Jarrett Kosart was given a fine. 
And he was given a fine because they found no evidence of him betting on baseball. Now, if you bet on baseball, uh, it is an automatic one-year suspension. And if you bet on your own team, then it is a lifetime ban. And, and that's why betting on baseball is so pertinent in this situation. It's not just that it's Shohei Otani, the biggest player in the sport, one of the, the most popular athletes in North America and frankly around the world. It then becomes an indictment on the game and how much we can trust it and how much we believe mm -hmm. what's out there yep. is real and is clean. And coming off, off the heels of the Houston Astros and yep. the, the 2017 sign-stealing scandal when what we saw on the field was at least in part a product of what was going on behind the scenes and was nefarious and was dirty and was wrong and, and frankly was being done not to that extent, but certainly was being done in other clubhouses um, and on other teams. I mean, that's when your sport starts to have a credibility problem. And when the credibility of the game is in question, everything else around it crumbles. Hopefully, I mean, when you start bringing up the credibility of the game, that reminds me of the home run chase in the sure. PED. And, and it feels like I hope baseball learned something from that um, process, as fun as it was and as great as it was for the game at yeah. the time. It feels like it's had a bit of a lasting effect that – I don't know that it would have been the same in other sports, but there's something about baseball culture. Charlie and I talked about yeah. this before that I, I I didn't grow up in baseball, so I'm hesitant to be even when people are talking about let the kids have fun and that stuff. Like I don't understand baseball culture that well, but I do understand that there is some puritanical nature to baseball culture that it seems the backlash to some of these things is harder in baseball than it would be in football because we like we have the Patriots yeah they did some cheating and the, we still celebrate that dynasty and so like part of it for me with baseball is like it's the one sport where numbers over time Bingo. really matter yep. and so like when you take away the credibility of those numbers like the home run chase like Aaron Judge's 60 second home run yeah, was significantly too. less sig important because you had sort of a marred record of Guys hitting 70, guys hitting – Bonds hitting 73, and it's like, what does this mean now? Right. And so when you take away the credibility of these star players, it does affect how people yeah. want to watch or sort of remember and stack these memories for baseball. One of, one of the reasons I love baseball so much is that it's a game for storytellers. And mm -hmm. the, the game's history, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very like – it's a very like – 1950s Americana black and white television type thing where it's fathers and sons and you know it's the the smell of fresh grass on opening day like baseball is one giant narrative and and the foundational element of that narrative is that even across generations, there are these numbers that resonate. You know, as, as we tell our stories and our interpretations of the sport, the thing that links us is those numbers. And it is telling each of those stories that, you know, you see a new version every generation and it can always be tied back, whether it's Babe Ruth coming into the game mm -hmm. uh, and, and changing it fundamentally and hitting 60 home runs, whether it's Mickey Mantle and, and Roger Maris chasing that number that nobody was coming close to and uh, ending up beating it. And and then when you get to Barry Bonds uh, at hitting 73 home runs, coming on the heels of Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, um, you know, you're involving this outside thing that if we're talking about a game that's rooted in yeah. its puritanical nature— I mean, you, Dom, you talked about clutching pearls before. Like, there was a whole <laughs> lot of pearl clutching going on in the early yeah. 2000s and the mid 2000s when Bonds was doing what he was, and we had a greater sense of it. A and yet, it's it's interesting to me because the, these same questions that we have in other areas of our life, whether it is art, whether it is music, whether it is movies, when right. it's entertainment, it's separating the artist and what he or she did from who he or she is as a person or the decisions he or she made. And you know what? I look at what Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds did, and I think it is selfish, and I wish that it didn't happen, but damn, it was fun.
And it was really cool to see. And it's, you know, it's like listening to music when there's an artist out there uh, who says some wild things, but you listen to them and you're like, okay, like that's a banger right there. Alone. Like, yeah. you, you know, how do, how do you separate those two things? It's, it's, I, a, it's a really yeah. difficult thing for us to do. And I think our nature uh, is, is frankly to, to give the artist or the person who is doing these things a far wider berth then that person yeah. probably deserves because the product that was produced was so incredible and brought such joy to our lives. I just wanted Mark down and Charlie to give me credit for restraint. There's several joke setups mm -hmm. that were s s laid out there for me by <laughs> oh, Jim yeah. We went to the fifties. Yep. We there's a lot of that. Black and white. Oh, and I just I just sat here quietly and let it happen. Mm -hmm. So I just want that credit. Mark it down. All right, Charlie, you got something was, else to say? I was just wistfully looking up into the rafters, <laughs> thinking about YouTube videos of Barry Bonds hitting dingers like deep into the bay. Yep. Uh, we're hits a five hundred and ten feet with a <sighs> bat looking like a toothpick. So to, to bring it back, there's something that I thought about credibility with this stuff, because obviously the credibility of the sport and the results are one thing. But I do think that there's a larger thing about the credibility of these leagues that we just keep getting larger and larger warning signs, mm -hmm. pushing and normalizing gambling. And I think we might look back in a while and be like, this is ridiculous that these leagues pushed and normalized and yeah. made gambling incredibly accessible. And it doesn't seem like with these flashing yellow lights, there's any stopping it. I mean, because they're flashing green That's... <laughs> dollar signs yeah. on the other side. And uh, the interview with uh, Mark Tatum, I, we focus on that a lot about balancing. And it was interesting that, Jeff, you brought up the idea of art. And that's the point that I was making in that conversation I think is important is anytime there's something that is artistic and you try to monetize it, there's going to be pressures to remove the soul and change the value of it. And that soul that baseball writers love to write about and talk about is getting uh pulled upon and it's not just baseball it's all sports mm -hmm. by these yeah uh, by this drive for um profitability not profitability for um profit maximization well let's look at baseball's economics for a second because there have been different drivers and the way that right. those drivers of economic maximization tended to peter out I think led directly into gambling. Um, back in the 1990s, you know, when baseball was talking about contracting franchises because it was not an economically viable sport, that's the you know, uh, that's the red herring that billionaires have thrown right. out for a really long time. Um, but what they hadn't found is cash cows yet, and the first cash cow they found was publicly funded stadiums. And I think anyone who's read up on the subject, uh, whether it's it's from Neil DeMoss and, and Field of Schemes, which was his brilliant book and continues on the website now, uh, or otherwise, uh, you know that publicly funded stadiums are a bad deal for taxpayers. But the notion, it gets back to the emotional element of things like the notion of losing a team potentially and being from Cleveland I saw my childhood football team up and leave, and it absolutely broke my heart. And I would say, hell yeah, you, publicly funded stadium was, yeah, I, you know what? Piss off. As a, as a I Baltimorean. Even, I know, I, I know. It. I don't even want to hear two, that. Two Super Bowls later. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Cleveland. Yeah, it was not, was not the best uh, for, for teenage <laughs> Jeff. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think once all of those stadiums were built, it's like, okay, well, where do we go now? And that's when regional sports networks came in and RSN mm -hmm. money, especially in baseball, when you don't have baseball, this yeah. centralized financial structure like the NFL does or, or this huge national deal like the NBA does, those local dollars were absolutely imperative, uh, except cable started to die. And once cable started to die, the RSNs uh, and, and their ability to make profits uh, shrunk and the shrinking of those RSNs led to bankruptcy, which puts us where we are right now, where, uh, you know, regional sports networks are, are, you know, hanging on by a thread unless it's the, the right. Yankees or the Mets or the Dodgers or these behemoth teams. So after that, it's like, okay. Revenue in a way that, that um, satisfies the smaller market teams, too. Right. Like, it's all a complicated business situation, and we're going to end up in the hands of all the tech billionaires like everything does at some point with the streamers. Like, that's, that's where we're headed, right? I, or that or the gambling money. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, when these areas dried up, you know, when, when the oil reserves just ran out and, you know, they were – 
the putting the spigot was not flowing, but it was just dribbling. It's like, okay, where do we find money now? And gambling has always yeah. been there. And it's been a third rail that sports haven't wanted to touch because they were worried about what the potential consequences of doing so would be. They felt like the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. Suddenly when all the other now juice dries up, they're looking for more juice right now <laughs> and they're squeezing that mother like you wouldn't believe. And, and this is what happens. We are talking about right. the potential credibility of the entirety of the sport. And, and we've been in these situations before, whether it was Tim Donaghy uh, in the NBA. The NFL's had its own way in the past. But right now, this is clearly the biggest gambling scandal that we have had since yep. the proliferation of sports gambling and the legalization across the spectrum. And Major League Baseball needs to be awfully deft in how it approaches this because uh, it, it needs to be firm and committed to finding the truth. Uh, without pissing off the partners who are enriching it. I want to get back to when the game was pure and talk about you and your son in <laughs> high school baseball. But first, we got to get a little bit deeper in the muck. I think I saw Charlie light up when you brought up like the commissioner. Well, so this is the thing. I, I actually think it's going to be fascinating. I want to know how you think Rob Manfred's going to handle this because it's not just this case. And this is something that you'll find fascinating too, Dominique. It's about protecting the players. We're seeing it across sports, whether it's, baseball, basketball, tennis, golf, people are betting on it and having really adverse reaction to players. You have J.B. Bickerstaff saying he has fans sending him death threats, saying they know where he lives. And mm -hmm. a lot of that is connected to the access to gambling. So Rob Manfred has to be really direct in how he handles this with Otani, but also with moving forward, setting a precedent for players to know what's right and what's wrong and for the league to know what's right and what's wrong. It, it's a spectacularly small needle to thread there and mm -hmm. rob manfred is generally not one who threads needles well like we've seen this with the houston astros Hunk of metal. we we have seen this with how he handled the lockout back in 2022 i mean listen rob manfred i i think he deserves credit for doing a lot of things i think the pitch clock was the most brilliant thing that's come along in baseball in decades and as as somebody who loves the sport loves the game. I really appreciate that. And Rob Manfred has been excellent at running the business of Major League Baseball and uh, and really like owning the players in terms of collective bargaining agreements. He has made very rich men much richer and he himself is handsomely compensated because of that. One thing he does not do well is speak publicly and lay out the nature of where the sport needs to be in terms of fans' perspectives. Like, he works for the owners. We know that. that that's yep. just what commissioners do now. They work for the owners. They work to protect the shield, if you will. I mean, that that is yep. their job. But in, Terminology I'm quite familiar with. Uh, no doubt, no <laughs> doubt. In this situation, yeah. though, um, the shield doesn't just involve owners and and the players who play under it. It involves the entire sport and the fans and the credibility of the game is at stake here. Whenever you're selling any sort of product, it, it has a brand and the brand is on the line. And part of the yeah. job of the commissioner is to protect the brand. And I think they should learn from the way that Shohei Otani came out and was like, or his group came out and was not organized and, yeah. was, and was kind of rushed in the way that they handled that scandal and take your time and, and learn yeah. from their own previous mistakes uh, as Manfred, the way they handled the Astros scandal. And like we mentioned, the way that the steroid era was handled, like, understand that this is a pivotal time and i think that we all see it as such and we understand that the decisions that are made and not only the decisions the words that are used are going to impact the way that this game is, is you know uh, what though dom i i don't viewed. i don't know that major league baseball's infrastructure is set up for that because in this situation what i think is necessary is transparency and Ooh. the the entirety of of how major league baseball's Department of Investigations is set up as opacity. It's it's secretiveness. Mm -hmm. It's you know we don't know what was in the report uh, that led to Major League Baseball's 324 game suspension of Trevor Bauer. Now I've heard all sorts of things, but you know never been able to prove it. And so he just kind of lingers there um, in the in the ether of the game. And when it comes to individual players, that is how it's handled. So what Major League Baseball knows, 
I'm not sure we're ever going to know. It feels more like we're likely to get that from the the public authorities and from whichever um, you know whichever governmental groups are in fact investigating this. Well, I mean, they do need to seem like they're in control and like they're leading yes. this process and not following the process and not kowtowing to any player, no matter how important they believe it. They can kowtow them to them privately, but it has to appear as though Major League Baseball is in control. These are important things, I think, going forward that can maintain whatever integrity that they have. But in a little bit of time that we have left, I would like to have fun. <laughs> Tell us a story about Jeff Passan. Uh, sitting in the stands watching his son strike out some uh, some young kids. I love it when he strikes out young kids. Uh, I, I, do, I do not love it when he walks, guys, though. I, I am... Um, so you're you're a, you're a celebrity, especially at a baseball game. People recognize you, and like I I have a similar experience at football games, so I'm extra cautious and controlled. I'm not, um, and I would assume you're the. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I here here's the thing. Like there's a there's a group of dads who will rein me in, and and my okay. my errors in these situations, I would I would like to believe I have never been called out by my child for my behavior at one of his games. And trust me, he would do that. But it's more my my self criticism and me understanding who I am on an everyday basis right. and how when I walk into a high school baseball stadium in the Kansas City metro area, that version of me goes away and. I'm not going to say like it's a more sinister version. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's like uh, I'm a psycho baseball dad. I just tend to be a pretty rational person, and I am not a rational. Ed. I, like there, there's no right. rationality at all when I'm sitting there. All right, tell me, tell me one time when um, things didn't go well, how you reacted, and then we'll end with a story of your son doing something awesome and you being really excited about it. How about that? Um, we were in Jefferson City, Missouri. He was facing, and so he was a freshman last year, and, uh, you know, he goes to a smaller school. They have a good program, but he, like, he was getting some mm -hmm. playing time last year as a freshman and was facing this team, you know, the, the, their, their shortstop, I think, was a sophomore who's already committed to Mizzou, like 6'3", and Dang. just a tank. And he was on the mound against them. And every pitch he threw, if it was a strike, I would not move. Like, I'm telling you, I would sit there and I would be thinking, okay, is, is the little hair on your eyebrow twitching now? If so, <laughs> stop it, you moron, because the kid's just going to uh -huh. continue to throw strikes if your eyebrow hair doesn't move. And if he threw a ball, I would just shift over in the seat just a little bit like so, uh, I, I, I would I would like to believe that other people didn't notice but of course so they was it is it super is it superstition or is it or is it you believe that whatever position in the atmosphere you are in is actually a scientific physical thing that is affecting his ability to pitch or it's just like I don't want to mess it up that worked I don't want to move you know what that that's the problem you never I don't thought know. that deeply. Like, I don't know what the actual answer to that question is. I've never given it. Just know that you got to move. I've, I've never given it any thought because mm. I don't want to sit there and acknowledge the fact that I'm a crazy person like this. Like, it's absolutely psychotic behavior. And I know deep Love down, it. fundamentally, at my core, that where I'm sitting, what I'm doing, has absolutely nothing to do with my child's ability to go out and execute a pitch. But if he doesn't, I don't want to leave it to chance. <laughs> I love it, man. Uh, and so he he struck he struck him out because you sat still. No, he turned. I will say this: he got a double play on the uh, kid going to Mizzou. Ooh, and trust me, nice. everyone else was standing up and cheering. I was just like this. <laughs> I can't move. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. <laughs> I love it. Just a statue. Well, all right, Jeff. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Uh, now that we're entering baseball season, we got to make this happen more often. If you are available, I appreciate you, buddy. And uh, you and Charlie, get ready for that meeting for a youthful um, white dude. Sunscreen committee? <laughs> That's Sunscreen, what we're committee. It. Sunscreen committee. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie, I'll see you at the Fountain right, of Jeff, Youth in April. Take it easy, buddy. We are joined. We're lucky enough to be joined by what I believe to be the best 
ESPN basketball analyst we have. It may sound like I'm just being like uh, a teacher's pet because she's here, but she is here because we decided that she's the best going. College, NBA, whatever, but it's March, so we're going to talk about college. It is Andrea Carter. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm not just blowing smoke. When we watch uh, ESPN, as everyone does for many hours a day, we always are like, hey, that's different, and that's good, and that's better. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, first of all, so much for having me, too, talking college basketball, women's college hoops, all the things. Uh, I obviously watch every show that you're on and uh, love <laughs> your is, analysis, so is, uh, I'm excited I, to be here. Now, I I know that's b- but I, you did the right thing. No, you got to do, do it. You got to 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 do it. When I say something really nice about you, you got to say something really nice about me. We both know that is garbage. Mm-hmm. But I do have one question for you, is Charlie. Are you going to say something nice about me? Nah, the, Charlie, no? we already said nice things about you. Earlier in the show with Jeff Passan, I said you are one of the few white people I know that doesn't age like uh, in dog years. That's, that's a, a hell of a compliment. Thank you. Your skin is fantastic. <laughs> White don't crack. Anyway, uh, Andrea, um, yeah, we should talk about basketball. Where do you want to start? You want to start with Kim Mulkey? You want to go Calipari? You want to go Caitlin Clark? Listen, I, can we just first start with – can we start with South Carolina for like yes. a quick second? Because – See, see, I told you guys I, she's good. I told you she's I good. I just – because, listen, I don't know if you all watched the game, but we came out at halftime, and it's very rare – that I'm at a loss for words. Like I almost always have something to say. <laughs> Anybody that's ever dated me in the past is probably irritated about it, but I usually have something to say. We came out at halftime of that game and I was just like, because I I just couldn't even put the dominance into words. Like South Carolina's bench outscored North Carolina's team, mm-hmm. y'all. Like we don't see that very often. South Carolina's bench scored 51 points. UNC scored 41. Like, the team, the way they played, the togetherness that they played with, the way they scored on the inside, the way they shot 9 of 23s, it was just it was just different. Like, there are some performances that you – and North Carolina's not a bad team. They just looked bad because of who they were going against. So it was just – we just have to start there because that's South Carolina's at their best, and it was remarkable. 56-19 at halftime, Ugh. which is – crazy that's why i was like this yeah we're not supposed to see that was like in the the earlier days of yukon dominance when we recognized that there was a big gulf between the women's basketball teams that took it seriously and then everyone else and we're now in a mature state of women's basketball where you're not supposed to be in a tournament getting your head bust like this but i remember again in a year i think it was for wiley was like doing crazy highlights and then when i actually tuned in to see a south carolina game I was like, she coming off the bench? <laughs> you, you, you bring her off the bench? Yes. And you know what's crazy about this game is early in the season, South Carolina played North Carolina. Malaysia Full Wiley barely played because <laughs> Dawn Staley, her head coach, was mad about her defensive execution. She comes out in this game, not only drops 20 points, but has three blocks and three steals, a couple of those that turned into transition buckets. So, like, just watching the growth of that superstar freshman under the leadership of Don Staley, it was painted perfectly in this matchup against North Carolina because it's a game where in the beginning of the season, she barely had enough defensive energy to see the floor. So now she's got the defensive energy to see the floor, and we get to see more of her offensive highlights, and all of her teammates are cooking as well. It's just unbelievable. I mean, it's it's obviously a dynasty, and um, Don Staley yeah. has been at the helm of it. What is it that's different or unique about what they do there and what Don Staley brings to to that team? You know what I think the most – and, and Jay Billis would be mad at me for saying most unique because he's like, there's no such thing as most new unique. Yeah, so let me just say with your words, the, Jay. the unique thing about South Carolina that I see right now with this team, and it's similar to UConn teams in the past, is the willingness for superstar talent – to come to South Carolina and be patient with the process. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so special. And that's why South Carolina has so much depth. Chloe Kitts comes off the bench. Chloe Kitts came to this team early and barely played last season. Chloe Kitts is a starter on almost any other SEC team. 
like any other SEC team in the conference, any other team in most conferences would take Chloe Kitts. I know multiple teams that could use her in this tournament right now. She goes to South Carolina, barely sees the floor last year, has a major role this season. Same thing with Malaysia Full Wiley. Same thing with Ashlyn Watkins. Raven Johnson and Bree Hall, who are starters now, they accepted that process earlier when they were younger in this situation. So it's just the willingness to learn for Camilla Cardoso to be willing yeah. to play alongside Aaliyah Boston and learn and figure it out. It's players come in that have incredible talent. They're willing to learn from the veterans and then they're prepared for when it's their moment. We've seen it season after season after season, even starting with Asia Wilson, going back to Asia Wilson's years. Like we have just seen players come in that trust coach Staley. They trust her to develop them as women. They trust her to develop them as far as players go. So, Dawn Staley had someone that came off the bench drafted in the first round <laughs> last year. Like yeah. that killed everybody in recruiting. Cause how do you, you can't even yeah. compete with that. So I think it's the willingness for these talented players to trust the process and buy in. And now they just have so much depth and it just keeps rolling. When we talk about women's sports, I think a lot of times we view it through the prism of men's sports. And I, yeah. I think that's, we don't, yeah. Obviously, no one means any disrespect by doing it, but that's like our framework for the way that we've seen sports. And when I see what's happening there in South Carolina, it reminds me of what we say college sports is supposed to be in men's and it's not. And like I played, obviously, college and professional sports. It's like I see that. I'm like, yes, no, it feels genuine. The things that Don yeah. Staley says after they have a scuffle with um, with LSU, the things that she says after getting knocked out of the tournament early, the things that she says to her players when they win championships, it feels like that person and that image and that that program that we all pretend like our school is, but it's really not. Oh, you thought you thought right. thought that morally. I thought about this also. This is running counter to like the sort of insidious effects of the transfer portal right, in men's yeah, basketball, NIL, yeah. where they're actually people yeah. are staying and being developed in a program no, there's team basketball rather than just being like, I need buckets. I know, and I I, I love it. I'm happy to see it, and everybody's a Don Staley fan. It's, yeah. And and um, Andre was right for us to start there instead of with all other foolishness that I tried to put up there. Yeah, we're not worried about that. We got to okay. start with we got to start with what's really good first. Right. Well, Hot take your question Give on on South Carolina. You remember the old days when it used to be like Tiger versus the field, mm -hmm. where it'd be like ridiculous. Are so you going to bet on Tiger Woods versus the field? This is a single elimination tournament. At this point, is it just South Carolina versus the field, and South Carolina should be favored? Yes. It is like it really is. And it sounds crazy, but we were saying South Carolina versus the field last year. Last year, South Carolina was a poor shooting team like this year. South Carolina is a good shooting team that could have a bad shooting night, but they're not a bad shooting team. Like the way that they've been able to, you know, they went from four and a half threes last year, a game at about 30 percent to six and a half, which you're like, oh, Drea, that's only two more threes a game. But now they're at 39 percent. So like they're taking less and making more, which is just ridiculous. For people that don't understand percentages, I'll just make it simple for you. They've got elite size, like Camila Cardoso. It's not just Camila Cardoso. They've got 6'4 and 6'4 coming off of the bench. Elite athletes, quickness on the perimeter, a veteran point guard in Tahina Papau, who when she plays aggressive and looks for her shot is a game changer. But when she doesn't need to score, she can facilitate. Only eight points today. She had six assists. But in round one, she had 18 points and hit four threes. So you just really never know. And for all of these players, it seems like they know when they need to take over. They know when they need to step up. They just have a really good read and a really good feel. Don Staley calls it the South Carolina standard. We don't know what it is. We just know they hold themselves to it. And that's what we've seen all season long. I would take South Carolina over the field because they have, in terms of depth, size, and skill, they can't be matched. And that skill includes three-point shooting. If I, I mean, I know I laid on the compliment stick before we started, but I just gained a new level of respect for you because I just realized what you've been doing is you've been running around with this hot take about how if Caitlin Clark yep. wins the national championship, she'll be the best player of all time. But you also know that Caitlin Clark ain't winning no national championship. She's not winning it. <laughs> They're not winning it. Like, and that's the thing. And I probably would have served myself better if I would have said, if Caitlin Clark wins the national championship, her resume is right. goaded. Like that, that probably would have served me better. I'm still learning some of this. Too, mm, so no, 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 me, no, 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 no. You got it right. You got it right. Listen, he, hear me out. That's okay. the thing. Like with, with Caitlin, 
here's the, here's the thing is when you're trying to pick GOAT, right, the best player of all time, it's so hard to split hairs right. between Maya Moore and Cheryl Miller and Candace Parker and Brianna Stewart and Shamika Holskall. It's so hard to split hairs between those because they all won multiple championships. Mm. They all played the game in different eras, so they never really faced each other. So all of those arguments are subjective. Right. It's like LeBron and Michael Jordan. It really is just who you felt like went out there, who you would want to start a team with. Caitlin is the first player that if she wins a championship, her resume has things that you're no longer splitting hairs. No one's done it. No one's done those things. It's not just the records. It would be leading her team to a championship without another WNBA draft pick by her side and breaking the records, people don't go to a school to dominate individually mm -hmm. and get a championship out of it. It's never been seen. You join a great program that has players that you can play with and win a championship. That's what most people do. Right. Or you go somewhere and you dominate individually and you break every record and you don't get one. Caitlin would be the first player that merges those two, mm -hmm. right? Juju might be Juju might be next, but her teammates are, or I would give her teammates a little more credit too. And then for Iowa fans, they say I'm dragging Caitlin's teammates, but they just got to pause because being compared to Renee Montgomery and Tamika Catchings and Sue Bird and Swing Cash, that's not a drag. I'm just saying you're not good as those greats are. So for me, one, I don't think Caitlin's going to win a national championship. Iowa might struggle against Colorado. But two, if she did, her resume would be goaded. You just can't compare what she's been able to do. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you. Um, Charlie's not going to let me get into what Audie Crooks did to my lady Terrapins. It was unacceptable. Referees don't Loved call it. fouls. They don't they, like it's just... he was he was complaining. NFL players complaining the game was too physical. I didn't he like actually it. called me. I he like called it. me this morning. Was like this like wasn't it. fair. I didn't like it. They weren't called. She was pushing people in the back, getting offensive rebounds, mushing. I sent it in the back of the head. That is a foul. That is a foul. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I mean, you give up a 20 point lead and then you can't really complain. That part. If the ref doesn't call it, it's not yeah. a foul. I don't Fair know what point. to tell you. Fair point. That's how I feel about pass interference. So we're on the same page. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm not. Exactly. I'm, Brenda brought us a championship. She's good with me. Um, what else you want to talk about? You want to get into some Calipari or, or what? Yeah. Time? I mean, yeah. I, the Cal stuff is fascinating because obviously 2012, it's not yesterday anymore. <laughs> they haven't made a final four since they had Carl Towns and Devin Booker. They've had. Jamal Murray, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Bam Adebayo. I'm forgetting more and more. Um, it's going to cost them $33 million for John Calipari not to be their coach next year. He got a lifetime contract. Kentucky's really mad. Do you think Coach Cal's coached his final game for Kentucky? With $33 million on the table? No, I don't think he's coached his last game in Kentucky. And you know what? Everybody's talking about the $33 million. But for me, what really makes me feel like coach Cal's not going anywhere is the fact that in all these seasons where Kentucky's struggling, which they do in the postseason, 19,000 fans still show up to every home game. So for me, I'm like, all these fans are mad on Twitter and on social media. That stuff's not real. Twitter and social media reactions are not real. Fans show up in the seats to watch these superstar one and done freshmen, because for the most part, they're fun to watch. Yeah. So, as long as the fans keep showing up and you have $33 million on the line, like coach Cal's not going anywhere. In my opinion, I would be shocked. Like it would be different if the fans boycotted right. and didn't show up to home games. I don't know. I mean, I, ever. I'd be shocked if they move on from this year, but I don't think, I think that that place believes that they should be in championship contention and not knocked out in the first round uh, by Oakland. And so I, I think that his job is in jeopardy. And I One in four in his last five tournament yeah, games that's tough and I, I think the thing that for me is that's watch tough. it watching his reactions one in four with superior talent is like the thing yeah but superior young talent though right that's i get the it thing. that's so, the thing like they're so superior, then what are you here for pal? Have an experience like okay. i get it i get it i get it that's but the roster like, he put together what are you here for you want to so i guess my issue with cal and it's not like i don't know him personally but he has a record that is Impressive on the court, for the most part, but yeah. there's yeah. issues off the court. But I think what bothered me is the the reaction. I mean, with like how much he's. Uh... Well, anyway, we won't get into any of that <laughs> stuff. What bothered me is his reaction to losing, yeah. and I hated it. Like every, it was multiple um, quotes where he is throwing people under the bus. And it just, I just didn't like it, saying how they're young. And before the tournament, he's like, yeah, we got a team that's built for the tournament. Then you get your beat in SEC tournament. Then you get your 
beat by Oakland and Michigan. And and then you come out and say that, well, we just weren't, weren't ready. We're too young, young guys yeah. making mistakes. What the hell are you there for? Aren't you the coach? Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I hear what you're saying. Oh, well, I, I don't know. Coaches annoy me, and Don Staley set a high bar. I expect all coaches to be like that, and I've been disappointed. Uh, There's a lot going them. on. There's a lot going on with a lot of coaches. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's just a lot. There's a lot. Well, we we're recording this before the Kim Mulkey big story is coming out. We see her preemptively yeah. warning us. So I I don't know how what's responsible for us to say about it, but I'm anticipating a lot of things coming out and her taking the position of the crooked media and it's going to annoy me and get under my skin. <laughs> yeah, that, that situation is interesting because there have been a lot of different things floating around about LSU or the players and Kim have, has chosen not to speak out sometimes. You know, sometimes she has been very closed off. So for Kim to have a statement about whatever is potentially coming down the yeah. line really piqued my interest, yeah. honestly, in what is going to be in the story because I'm like, Kim, she yeah. doesn't always take time to respond to things yeah. in that way. I don't know anything about it. I don't know what's yeah. coming down the line, but what I do know is this LSU team, the bigger their chip on the shoulder, on their shoulder, and they seem to pull together for her. Like, this is a team that has almost rallied through chaos sometimes. Like, they had a lot of issues yeah. early in the season that seemed to pull them together. So this could be a thing that, to the frustration of some of their opponents, actually gives them an even bigger chip on their shoulder and kind of galvanizes that team, pulls them together, and they play right through it. It could be a distraction, but it really could go one of two ways. And the way they came back against Middle Tennessee today and ended up getting a big win, if you're an LSU fan, you might breathe a little easier because you're like, all right, it wasn't enough to deter them from getting this win. Maybe they can move past it. I hate that Angel Reese is on that team. She was a Terrapin. I wish she would have stayed there. But she also – uh we grew up in the same neighborhood, so I want her to have success, but, I mean, yeah, Kamalki's annoying. Fair. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, maybe this is just the, the really low-hanging cape. I just can't imagine there's going to be anything that could change what I imagine Kim Mulkey's character to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it is it – those, those outfits, they uh, – it's, it's funny when, when uh, you don't also seem like uh, – I don't know. It goes back to the Britney Griner stuff. Like, there's so many things about her history that's just like it makes it uncomfortable. And like the history with um, like the sexuality of her players and her trying to like stifle them from being public about it. Like, I assume some of that stuff will be in the story. Whatever. We'll see the story. We'll talk about it all over again. Then shout out to Angel Reese, Randallstown's finest. Anyway, Andrea, you're the best. We love you. Come Thank back you. again soon, Appreciate sometime. It. Um, and good luck with the rest of the coverage of the tournament. I appreciate y'all. Thanks for having me. Tune in. It's lit. We got Samuel L. Jackson tweeting about women's college basketball. Yeah. I'd never really thought I'd see the day. So, you know, it's it's lit over here. Thanks, uh, thanks for tuning in. All right. That was fun. Thank you so much for Jeff Passan and Andrea Carter for joining us. Also, of course, big thank you to the producers. Charlie. Brian. Uncle Kevin. Congratulations. Uh, Serafina. Megan. We're out. Podville, too. Not Cortez. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.